thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, it's, a, it's a great meeting, and I can see there's a lot of exciting things going on. Um, and that's, I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about the background to all the exciting work that you're doing. Um, but one of the things I guess I wanted to start with is that I think it's, it's a well-known fact that it's often forgotten in this day and age that cancer immunotherapy is not new. Um, it's something that the field of cancer has been working on since people have been working on therapeutic drug development in cancer. Um, the recognition that uh, a cancer cell will express, quote, foreign or altered antigens, neoantigens, and be recognized by T cells is something that has been observed in the clinic for hundreds of years now. Um, and that's a basic tenant of um, uh, immunotherapy. And early attempts at immunotherapy were trying to use exactly the same thought processes and methodologies that we use to develop drugs today. Coley's toxin, I would say, is probably the first immunotherapy, um, which was in 1891 uh, developed by William Coley when he injected streptococcal cultures into a patient with a sarcoma lesion with a complete response and a disease-free survival of eight years. In fact, Coley's toxin was used as a therapeutic um, for many years thereafter. And I think part of the reason it hasn't stuck or evolved as a therapeutic modality is in large part because we haven't, we did not well understand what are the patients who are more likely to respond or not respond to this type of therapy. And that's something that still I think we grapple with today. I, I would say the next wave of immunotherapeutics um, in oncology were the development of the use of IL-12 or high-dose IL-12 in real cell carcinoma and melanoma in the early 1990s. And you can see um, that there is this, what we call the tail of the curve, patients who have long-term survival from these therapies and really could be considered cured. And I always put that in quotes because it's difficult for me as an oncologist to use the word cure in the metastatic setting. It's something we very rarely see. And similar to the use of Coley's toxin, I think the hard difficulty with um, high-dose IL-12 as a therapeutic is that it was really difficult to know who are the patients who are likely to respond. And you can see that the vast majority do not, and the vast majority do not get benefit from this therapy, which actually can be quite toxic as well. So it's another therapy that I think has had limited life um, in, the, in, the, in clinical use because of a lack of understanding of what is the biomarker for which we can enrich patients who are really going to get this long-term benefit. I think that checkpoint inhibition really represented a new era in solid tumor oncology, at least. Um, because obviously there's an entire field of CAR T cells, uh, I think, making a completely different impact in hematologic malignancies. But um, the, the development of checkpoint inhibition in solid tumor oncology was notable, I think, for the primary reason that we saw somewhat more patients getting long-term benefit, and more importantly, across a wide spectrum of malignancies. And that actually is why I differentiate a little bit um, the development of CTLA-4 from PD-1 or PD-L1 targeting agents, which I think really represent the, the, the breakthrough that we're seeing that opened the door for new immunotherapeutics. CTLA-4 um, inhibition has had a big impact in melanoma, um, but PD-1-based or, or PD-L1-based immunotherapies have had broad spectrum impact across cancer, and in fact, I would say have transformed the foundations of cancer care. And and I think it was actually surprising to, to most of us, immunologists, oncologists, anyone in the field, because it wasn't clear cut that one particular T cell, tumor cell interaction was going to be able to generate monotherapy responses given the complexity of tumor cell and T cell interactions that we know about, or T cell, T cell interactions. But um, one, one of the hallmarks of uh, PD-1 is that it is upregulated um, on activated T cells so that, it, that the immune response that's generated to any kind of foreign antigen can be limited, um, which is a very useful and important part of our own body's mechanisms to limit immune responses to not get out of control, but it's a very unfortunate aspect of our normal human biology that's been co-opted by cancer. In fact, um, many tumor cells express high levels of pdl one to block immune cell responses at baseline, so that there's a cons consistent uh, immunosuppressive tumor environment regardless of what's happening outside the tumor. And what was demonstrated with PD-1 blockade or PD-L1 blockade is that you can restore, excuse me, tumor, uh, T cell activation and actually get tumor cell killing regression and long-term survival. 
So I bring up this case because it was one of the first patients I treated on a phase one study of nivolumab, or MDX-1106, it was, as it was known at the time. She was a 56-year-old woman with a history, actually, of multiple cancers, um, a moderate smoker, uh, or modest smoker, really, who presented with hypoxia while exercising and was admitted with respiratory failure. Um, she actually had a very aggressive surgeon who was able to uh, save her, actually, by doing tracheal reconstruction. After that, she came to me, and she was given standard therapy at the time, which was, considered, which was chemotherapy and radiation. She quickly recurred with multiple lesions in the lungs and then received a series of monotherapy chemotherapies with continued growth through all of them. She started on this phase one trial of MDX-1106, which later became nivolumab, uh, in 2010, and had a partial response, meaning she had regression of some of the lesions, um, which lasted for about a year, and then some of them started to increase. Her surgeon, who was the, uh, the same aggressive surgeon that had reconstructed her trachea, actually removed all of the remaining lesions, which were five bilateral lesions, so um, she had lung surgery on both sides. And many of those uh, showed either a minimal tumor component or actually no tumor component, but a robust inflammatory infiltrate. She has been disease-free ever since, and this is what we consider a true classic responder, somebody who gets long-term response, and even if we get fooled radiographically that there's been growth, that growth is truly just a robust immune response. However, she represents really a minority of patients, and you can see that this curve looks not unlike those um, IL-12 curves that I showed you earlier. And the latest update of this nivolumab phase one study in non-small cell lung cancer shows a five-year overall response rate of 16%. A more recent pooled analysis from four different studies in lung cancer actually suggested maybe 14% low overall, but I think the remarkable thing about that pooled analysis is that of those patients who had a complete or partial response that was sustained at six months, 58% were alive four years later, which means if we can select the right patients and know who's really going to get benefit, we really actually can potentially cure people. So what the challenge is and what I'm going to talk a little bit about is how do we define who will achieve benefit from pdl one monotherapy as opposed to trying combinations? And um, who will achieve that long-term benefit, what we could, would call those long-term survivors or potentially cured patients? How can we better select patients for any of these therapies? Because we clearly see that there can be benefit, but, but the many patients are still not getting benefit. So for those many that are not, who needs additional combination therapy to get them over that hump, over whatever still immunosuppressive barriers remain, to get benefit? And it, will it be the same solution for all? Almost certainly not. So really, which combination do we need for which patients? And I think that's really the era that we're in right now is evaluating uh, immunotherapy combinations, both with chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, and other immunomodulating agents. But that represents the now. There's about 2,000 trials going on, actually, of immunotherapy, immunotherapy combinations. But beyond combinations, what is the next step? And that's where I really believe the work that uh, you all are doing here in protein engineering is going to take us to the step beyond. Combinations represent... Um, a possible temporary solution, but I don't think they're the long-term solution. I think what we really need, because we know there are multiple T-cell interactions, multiple tumor T-cell interactions, there's going to need to be multiple shots on goal, and if we can integrate them into the same drug, we will relieve potential toxicity concerns from con combinations, be able to better understand biomarkers of response, um, potentially get more efficacy, um, and potentially reduce toxicity. So just to start with a little bit of discussion of biomarkers of response to PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibition, this has been a really challenging uh, field for the very reason that the more we look, the more um, parameters that you find that can influence response to immunotherapy and, and uh, tumor immunity in general. Um, this is, you know, for pe people like myself, I'm a thoracic oncologist who works in lung cancer, this is hard because when we um, started immunotherapy in lung cancer, we were on the back of successes um, from uh, targeted therapy in lung cancer where we knew that actually if you can enrich for the right molecular characteristic for a particular drug, a patient can get long-term benefit. And that's how we really would like to think of immunotherapy as a targeted therapy. And we have seen some uh, use of biomarkers, but it's certainly not the way it is for molecular fixed um, changes that can be used as biomarkers. But there are low-hanging fruit for potential predictive markers, and these include pdl one expression on tumor cells which has variable degree of expression in different tumor types. Neoantigen load, uh, we know that one of the critical factors to get an immune response is actually being able to present a neoantigen that's recognized as foreign and get uh, killed by a T cell. 
And whether we can measure that accurately is, I think, still an open question, but there are a lot of surrogate measures, such as tumor mutational burden, microcytolite instability, that are used to give a, a approximation of the neoantigen load in a tumor, and just the presence of T cells themselves. Uh, you need T cells to get an immune response, period. So those, those are things that are easy to look at, and at least uh, theoretically easy to potentially use as clinically defined biomarkers. Um, in fact, in the development of pembrolizumab, PDL1 was investigated as a biomarker, as it was for all of the agents um, in the phase one trials. But you can see that uh, the, the differentiation was, was hard to get at. So I didn't put this a slide in here, but I often show this slide of targeted therapeutics, um, including ALK inhibitors, for which an ALK rearrangement in the DNA will select for a very high level of response, around 94%, with long-lived durable responses. In this case, uh, in this training set that was used, the best cutoff we could get was at a 50% level or higher of PDL1 expression that would give a 37% chance of response. And you can see that even those who had negative PDL1 still had some chance of response. So not a huge differentiation. In a separate validation set, this kind of became 45%, but it, it wasn't dramatic, at least in terms of response. And it didn't matter really how you sliced or diced the, trying to look at PDL1 as a biomarker. If you looked at H scores or intensity um, or looking at immune cells and tumor cells expression, it didn't really seem to make a difference. What was settled on in the case of pembrolizumab was just the per percentage of tumor cells that were expressing PDL1. So this is basically considered 100% as is this, even though you can see that there is some variation between these two. When that was used, though, in the entire subset and in a, and a separate validation subset, even though the response rates were not that different, you can see that above 50, at 50 percent or above, that really clearly differentiates a group of patients who get long-term survival benefit. And there's almost a complete overlap between patients who have no PDL1 expression versus anywhere up to 50 percent expression. And this actually became a, a real source of controversy in the field, I think, a few years ago, because some trials which looked at different thresholds, different cutoffs, using different assays of PDL1 expression, they did not find that PDL1 was a biomarker. But in fact, they all actually behave relatively similarly. It's just that it behaves as a much better biomarker only at high levels of expression. If you take um, two different nivolumab studies in uh, non-small cell lung cancer compared against chemotherapy, they looked at much lower levels of expression uh, of PDL1, but they saw the same trend that there was an improved survival the higher the PDL1 expression. I, I think in general what we, what we know now that we've compared uh, multiple antibodies against each other is that um, PDL1 is a poor biomarker at relatively low bio, uh, levels of expression. It's only when you get above 50 percent and really ideally above 80 percent that you're getting good uh, discrimination of who's going to likely benefit or not. And you know this did lead the way though to uh, doing a phase three trial comparing uh, chemotherapy, which is the standard of care in non-small cell lung cancer and a very poor standard of care which really leads to an overall two-month survival benefit in lung cancer, um, which I would say no one really chooses to get chemotherapy for a two-month benefit. But uh, looking at the subgroup of patients who had greater than 50 percent PDL1 expression and giving them either pembrolizumab or chemotherapy resulted in a very, very wide differential between um, uh, response and progression-free survival as well as overall survival. So it really led to a rapid uptake of widespread clinical testing despite all the controversy, despite the fact that the, um, it doesn't completely discriminate patients who will benefit, uh, meaning patients who have no PDL1 expression can still benefit. It is a dynamic biomarker. It's not a fixed. Uh, obviously, the immune microenvironment is changing all the time with response to therapy, with tumor progression. So it really, how you sample it can affect uh, what you get. But despite all of those issues, it clearly differentiates uh, to, to be a better uh, therapy overall for this particular patient group. And because of that, it has become something that's uh, tested for widely in cancer clinics across the world. The uptake of this was very dramatic. Um, with a quadrupling in testing rates within a three-year period to now it's over 80 percent. Now, I will say this uh, has become more complicated um, with the use of pdl one therapies in other malignancies. One of the other drugs that was developed at the same time as uh, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, which is a pdl one targeting agent, um, developed an assay that really looked primarily at, at both immune cells and tumor cell expression of PDL1. In fact, the antibody was optimized to look at immune cells. In general, it's actually less sensitive for tumor cell expression and immune cell expression, but it does look at immune cells, uh, which the um, pembrolizumab assay does not. 
And in a phase three trial that was just uh, finished uh, uh, late 2018, they demonstrated that um, there was an improved overall survival in combining chemotherapy with atezolizumab and metastatic triple negative breast cancer. You can see that the separation in these lines is actually very poor overall. But when you look at just the patients who express PDL1, just at a level of greater than 1% on immune cells only, there's a bigger differential. And in fact, the FDA granted accelerated approval for this particular subgroup, the PDL1 expressing subgroup, just this last month. It complicates things for pathology laboratories because now they've just sort of agreed on an assay to look at tumor PDL1 expression, and now we'll actually have to address immune cell expression as, as well. And the assay that was approved as a companion diagnostic is not the same assay that's used for tumor, tumor cell expression. So it has put a new challenge into the field, but one I think that's important for us to figure out and figure out quickly. Um, because in the end of the day, we, don't, we would like patients to be on these blue lines and not on the red lines. So what about tumor mutational burden as a predictive marker? In many ways, this has been a much more appealing uh, predictive marker because it makes, uh, I, I think it has a lot of scientific rationale, the idea that uh, higher neoantigen expression should lead to an improved tumor immune response. And in fact, what we've seen from early studies is that the tumor types that have the highest tumor mutational burden overall, which is used in this sense as a surrogate for neoantigen load, have the best overall responses, uh, response rates to immunotherapy. And these were the early cancers where the, there was initial approvals of immunotherapy, first melanoma, lung cancer, and then bladder cancer. So it certainly makes sense. And it's something that has been looked at, um, and at least in retrospective studies, validated as a common biomarker across malignancies, which pd one has more variability to. The, um, the problem is, is how do you actually measure it, and do you, can you get consistent results? This was, again, you, looking at that same um, pembrolizumab phase one study and looking retrospectively at tumor mutational burden, which was clearly associated in a discovery cohort and then in a validation cohort as um, associated with improved overall survival. Um, the problem is, is that in, in subsequent studies, it's been a little harder to define this as a true survival uh, and, um, predictive biomarker in a prospective way. And part of that is because as, as a field, we're rushing ahead in general, we use tumor mutational uh, burden as a surrogate, and it's some, in part because it's something that we can actually surrogate even further in a clinical way. In clinical testing, we, and especially in lung cancer, we often do targeted next generation sequencing to identify oncogene addicted cancers, and that same output can be used to uh, estimate tumor mutational burden. But the problem is, is that although there's a correlation between targeted next generation sequencing and whole exome sequencing, it's far from perfect. It's a loose correlation in general to mutational burden, of true neoantigen burden. And as you can see from some of these um, plots here, there's a really skewed distribution. So just taking the median and saying patients over this level or under this level will have a higher or lower response rate to uh, immunotherapy is a little bit misleading when these are probably a very different biology than these patients down here. It's also known that only a subset of mutations truly result in actual quality neoantigens that can generate a robust um, immune response, at least in vitro. We know now that subspecific types of mutations are probably more predictive or independently predictive of immune response um, compared to just looking overall at the total. So frame shift insertion deletions, which are enriched actually in, in patients with macros microsatellite instability, are more predictive. Apobec genesis generates um, particularly, uh, particular changes that are more predictive of true neoantigens and viral neoantigens are more predictive of actually generating new antigens than just a gross estimate in general. So that tumor mutational burden is something I think we um, are still trying to define, but the advantage to looking at it is that tumor mutational burden is actually not associated with pdl one expression or with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. In other words, these are separate measures and separate predictors of a potential response. That lends itself to sort of thinking about how we could use these in complementary ways, and I think that's sort of the next uh, phase of, of clinical utility that we, that we need, is to integrate these biomarkers to actually better select patients. Uh, one of the groups at Yale actually defined these different potential uh, four states, although I think there are probably many more in between these, um, because of the differences that you see when there's high, um, excuse me, high tumor infiltrating cells versus uh, low pd one expression, which may be reflective of actually getting that adaptive immune response that you've um, generated, basically increased pd one expression on immune cells as a way to adapt and limit the immune response, versus uh, tumor types which have high pd one expression at baseline or some kind of intrinsic conduction as a tumor-evolved way of avoiding 
uh, or evading the immune response. Uh, so in theory, we could integrate sort of these different kind of measures, either with TILS and PDL1, which actually have a fair degree of overlap, or potentially with T cell with um, tumor mutational burden and inflammatory signatures, which actually go very well with um, TIL infiltration overall. Gene expression profiles of inflammation actually match very well with TIL expression, so it's something we could actually integrate and look at as a complementary to, again, PDL1 to really enrich for patients who are likely to respond and really try to eliminate um, patients who are, who are not likely to respond and not likely to receive benefit. Some studies have already tried to look in a retrospective way and seen actually that if you integrate the PDL1 and TMB, which are both easily testable in the clinic, you can get a much better selection of patients who are more likely to respond. Although again, you haven't really completely ruled out those who still might and have low levels. But I will say that I think going forward as we think about combination therapies, integrating biomarkers is even more important because then we're actually trying to look at and combine different methodologies of stimulating immune responses and how that will play out when we've worked out a biomarker for monotherapy is still not yet clear. These are tools that we have today, PDL1, tumor mutational burden, and looking at the immune microenvironment. So given the fact that there is this very incomplete overlap, we really have the opportunity to do a lot more than we're doing at present in terms of patient selection. This is a slide that many people may have seen because it's really from quite some time ago and it circulated a lot. Uh, it's from 2012 from Tony Rebus, but I think it really still holds true today. We are still not where we want to be. Um, when we started targeted therapies in cancer care, uh, excuse me, we, for a small subset of patients with oncogene-driven cancers, we could extend um, the chance of benefit for a longer period of time, although none of those really are curative therapies, so they all end up at the same place as chemotherapy might be the baseline here. With immunotherapies, um, monotherapies, particularly PD-1 agents, we're, we're getting a tail of the curve. Some patients are getting long-term survival, but what we really want to be is having a much larger proportion of, of patients get initial benefit and retain that benefit long-term. And I don't think we're there yet. Um, combinations and sequencing is, are the approaches that we're in the middle of now. I think uh, looking at integrated approaches with new protein engineering um, developments is sort of the, the future of that. But one of the, some of the change, changes from combination therapy have already happened, and I will just again use lung cancer as an example. Um, but this is a study uh, we did looking at combination, combining pembrolizumab with chemotherapy in all patients, regardless of PDL1 expression, compared to chemotherapy, and saw that for all patients, regardless of PDL1 expression, there was a significant improvement of overall survival. You can see a wide separation between these curves. Interestingly, though, there was still um, a separation in terms of who was mo most likely to benefit based on PDL1 expression. So those with the highest levels of PDL1 expression, these are increasing levels here less than 1, 1 to 49, or greater than 50, either for overall survival or, or progression-free survival, the greatest benefit was in those who had the highest levels of pdl one expression. And that sort of begs the question of really, is, is combining chemotherapy with PD-1 immunotherapy a, a synergistic approach, or is it just an additive approach? The theory certainly is that chemotherapy results in cell lysis, neoantigen exposure, and neoantigen presentation, and increased ability to have an immune response. But the fact of the matter is, is that all the trials that have been ongoing have been studied with just combining them at the same time, and not differentiating for what is the effect of the chemotherapy versus the immunotherapy. What we do know is that in lung cancer and in breast cancer, when you look at the monotherapy activity of some of these agents and then their combinations, they really do seem additive. And given that there is this PDL1 um, uh, selection, it, it's not clear actually whether we're really getting synergy or not, or what that biomarker might be. So, and, and I'll just use another patient to sort of illustrate the, the problems that chemotherapy and uh, combinations with immunotherapy have made for us going forward in terms of how we take the next step in development. This was another patient of mine from 2017 who was a 47-year-old artist, again, with a modest smoking history, but exposures um, because of his work to solvents and textiles and chemicals. He presented initially with abdominal pain and weight loss and was found to have lung adenocarcinoma metastatic to his pancreas and lymph nodes and had a KRAS G12C mutation, among many others. He had a relatively high tumor mutational burden of nine mutations per megabyte, megabase, but um, considered below the threshold where you might think of an uh, immunotherapy combination instead of chemotherapy, and a low level of pdl one expression. He um, 
because of the, the data that was emerging about uh, overall survival benefit um, for all patients and the fact that there were high response rates in those chemotherapy, immunotherapy combinations, he was treated with a combination of carboplatin, pemetrexid, two different chemotherapies, and pembrolizumab with complete resolution, actually, of uh, most of his visible disease and a very marked response overall. He did incredibly well, but after six months developed colitis and a known immune-related complication, his therapy was held, and a repeat scan shortly thereafter showed progressive disease. He progressed very quickly thereafter through two different kinds of monotherapy, um, chemotherapies, underwent a new biopsy which showed an increased tumor mutational burden, which is something we frequently see, and it's again another dynamic marker of immune response, and was given a combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, which has been shown to be potentially more effective in patients with higher um, tumor mutational burden, again with no response. He also received concurrent radiation, which has some potential synergy with immunotherapy, again with no response, and ultimately died about 14 months after his diagnosis. That time frame of his lifespan and the experience that he had was very similar to the experience patients may have had 15 or 20 years ago with chemotherapy alone. And it really begs the question, I think, even though he had a very good initial response, was he ever really responding to immunotherapy, or was this all just a chemotherapy-driven response? And how do we differentiate that um, in the aftermath? Um, so if, if it is additive benefit, we, we really haven't defined yet from any of the trials that have been ongoing and have changed the standard of care now in lung cancer, now in breast cancer, potentially in many other cancers where we have phase three trials reading out. How do we define who's benefiting? And then if they do progress, what is the next step? It, do they have immunotherapy resistance or do they have chemotherapy resistance? How do we define innate resistance to immunotherapies, which were well defined in the monotherapy setting versus acquired resistance, which may mean um, uh, that they really had a response and then maybe lost the neoantigen expression, lost beta 2 microglobulin, or something else that really defined immunotherapy specific resistance. So how do we separate out then the um, utility of biomarkers that we used um, and imperfectly in monotherapy? How do we integrate them appropriately in combination therapy? Do we integrate them differentially in an IO-IO combination versus an IO-chemo combination or versus an IO-radiation combination? The biomarkers of benefit, in other words, to combination therapy are more challenging and not well-defined. And that's why I think it's somewhat essential that we try to break apart what's happening when we put two different uh, kinds of approaches together. Uh, it's known, actually, that chemotherapy can have variable effects on the immune microenvironment. This was work from my institution um, at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where we looked, actually, in multiple cancer, multiple lung cancer subtypes, this is in small cell lung cancer, before and after cisplatin. In small cell lung cancer, we very rarely see pd one expression on tumor cells, but it can be seen on tumor infiltrating macrophages. And you can see here that there's a robust increase in that expression after chemotherapy, but again, only within the macrophages. And how that would have potentially affect subsequent response to immunotherapy or subsequent response to combination is not yet well known. But chemotherapy is often touted as almost certainly increasing or enhancing the immune response. But in many cases, we can see no change in pdl one expression or uh, even no change or decreases in immune cell infiltration. So it's really not clear. It may vary depending on the chemotherapy agent, depending on the uh, particular tumor type, the context and stage of disease, a lot of unknown still. One ongoing trial that I hope will help, at least in lung cancer, is actually to try to separate out these components and analyze in a very comprehensive way the biomarkers associated with chemotherapy effects on immune microenvironment versus immunotherapy. This is an ongoing cooperative group trial, uh, which is looking at either sequencing patients with pembrolizumab first or chemotherapy first, followed by the combination, and then getting paired biopsies with really comprehensive immunoprofiling to evaluate what's the component um, uh, contribution of each of these, and how can we best combine these? Should they, in fact, be sequenced and not combined up front, or which patients should get them and in what order? So in general, I would say chemotherapy, immunotherapy combinations have made a big uh, dent and a big impact in cancer care for now, but I think they are a very transient solution to extending the benefit of immunotherapy to more patients. And I think the future really relies in actually getting a more robust T cell response where PD-1, uh, targeting PD-1 and PD-L1 is not sufficient. And that's really what dominates the clinical trial space now. But I think the future, which is also uh, now and in the clinic, are really in these novel engineered therapeutics combining um, targeting within a single drug product. And that the most famous example, obviously, is CAR, are CAR T cells, which have made a big impact already in hematologic malignancies. I think we're still in the early days of looking at these in 
solid tumors, um, but the idea of taking a T cell from an individual patient and engineering it to then also target a specific tumor cell is something that conceptually certainly crosses boundaries across both solid tumors and uh, he malignancies, although I think it will be much more challenging in solid tumors to do that with a single target, and it may require multiple targets. Bispecific antibodies, tri-specific antibodies that are, are redirecting T cells or redirecting NK cells, as in the case of bikes or trikes, uh, are another approach that has, again, already had some success in hematologic malignancies, and I think we're hoping to see um, that come, uh, come of age in solid tumors. And antibody cytokine uh, fusions are also starting to come into the clinic now. But they emphasize that they're really combining approaches, right? Combining uh, an antibody targeting a T cell and something targeting a uh, tumor cell, or combining something targeting a T cell and then combining a cytokine, which might amplify that response. So doing more than one thing alone. And that's certainly been the approach uh, at Lilly, and I think at many companies in this space, is trying to think about how we might use complementary mechanisms of action to enhance the immune response. Um, this is a very small list of things that are publicly uh, uh, in the clinic already, but trying to use agents that might tra uh, target trafficking and T-cell infiltration combined with um, uh, T-cell activation or targeting checkpoint inhibition ag uh, along with T-cell priming to amplify that response. And there are many different kinds of combinations that you could think about to do that. One of the combination approaches that um, uh, is being used at Lilly is uh, using this engineered IL-10 molecule, a pegylated IL-10 developed by Armo Biosciences, which was acquired by Lilly last year. Um, but again, it sort of uses the principle that more than one thing is happening when you get tumor antigen recognition by um, CD8 T cells, um, that uh, tumor antigen recognition can cause both IL-10 receptor increase as well as PD-1 increase on CD8 positive T cells. And PD-1 is a negative feedback on those T cells, but IL-10 uh, could be a positive feedback. So combining an anti-PD-1 with a pegylated IL-10 could be a really synergistic way to approach um, cancer cell killing. And making this pegylated form of IL-10 does two things. It allows you to give high doses that have sustained, has a sustained half-life. And in doing that, um, Armo actually showed that pegylodecacan, which is what they call this pegylated IL-10, induces phosphostat-3 in intratumoral CD8 cells and results in an expansion of tumor-specific T cells. This is as measured in the tumor, uh, but also uh, more um, in depth that's been measured in the periphery, that they, that they can get expansion of several hundred previously not detectable T cell clones that are exhausted T cells or, 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 part, or antigen experienced T cells, so tumor cells, uh, T cells that express both PD-1 and LAG3, so presumably tumor-specific T cells. And that differentiates this molecule from things like IL-15 or IL-2, which really just causes nonspecific T cell activation. And, um, sorry, let me just skip through this. Um, in looking in the clinic at a combination of peg and uh, anti-PD-1 inhibitors and non-small cell lung cancer, you see exactly what you would um, uh, predict to see from the diagram I just showed you before, that you're getting uh, many more responses. This is a spider plot of responses over time. In, you get many more responses than you would expect in an unselected population of non-small cell lung cancer from PD-1 therapies alone. The overall unselected response rate is about 20%. What was seen in this study was about 43%. And you can see that the responses are happening in patients with high uh, PD-1 expression, that's in the red, but also negative PD-1 expression in the green, as well as in between. And although this was a very small group of patients, only about 34 patients, the overall survival in that study was a median of 24 months. Chemotherapy, on the other hand, is around 12 to 13 months. Uh, uh, for an unselected population with pembrolizumab, that rate is about 16 and a half months. So at least some indication that you can get a lot more with, um, than with uh, PD-1 monotherapy alone by combining or amplifying that response uh, with the right complementary IO-IO combination. Um, but again, I think all of you are doing work in, in areas to really look at combination immunotherapy strategies um, within the same drug, which, which might do a lot more than combining therapies separately. And it's a critical factor because there are really so many different stromal cell interactions and cancer cell interactions and immune cell interactions with cancer cells and also immune cell and stromal cell interactions. And bringing T cells into the tumor and overcoming that immunosuppressive environment is likely to require a multi-pronged approach. Um, at Lilly and I think at many companies, there have been a lot of efforts in trying to look at 
ways where you can combine different targets into the same molecule using different geometries and different affinities to get the best potential response. The, one of the most, I, I think, common and um, probably the most potent way of doing this is actually combining uh, FAB or uh, an antigen recognition fragments of antibodies together, um, targeting both a T cell and an immune cell. And that's shown in purple here in an in vitro assay has the most potent response. But you can still get much more potency just by combining within the same molecule, even with a larger molecule like a tandem FAB or a full bispecific antibody compared to if you just put two antibodies together on their own. So that they really can get, you can really get a significant synergy by combining these approaches within one molecule. Um, the other advantage of these molecules is that then they can really redirect T cells to uh, actually lyse tumor cells in a very specific, target-specific way, which is not necessarily achieved by just combining two different types of drugs in the same um, patient. Uh, and, and again, I think there can be a lot of uh, um, opportunities to play with the geometry and affinity of the different components of biospecifics, which can enrich for uh, potential response. So this just shows you that by looking at using a different epitope, um, you can get really essentially the same response from a bi full bispecific antibody versus a tandem fab. And the advantage to the antibodies, and you can get a long-lived response because the antibodies can have a much longer half-life. So playing with the engineering here can give you, again, closer to what you're trying to achieve when you can put two antibodies together or put two molecules together that have a long half-life, but actually integrating them in the same molecule to achieve higher potency and higher specificity. One of the key um, things I think we've seen in the early days of uh, redirecting T cells with CD3 bispecifics is the toxicity, which is seen again with uh, redirecting T cells by CAR T cells as well, that you can get a very robust nonspecific T cell response, which can be really life-threatening in many cases for patients. Um, and, and by reducing the CD3 affinity to try to reduce that T cell component, nonspecific T cell component, you can get just as potent tumor cell responses without sacrifice, uh, so not sacrificing the potency of the molecule against tumor cells, but potentially at least opening the door to reducing toxicities. Um, you can see that the potency can also vary by the uh, receptor density, and there are opportunities, I think, in designing the molecule itself to increase or enhance receptor density when those two cells come together. And I'll just give you an example of one of the bispecific antibodies that uh, Lily has in the clinic, which is a combination uh, uh, antibody targeting PDL1 and TIM3. So TIM3, it, which can be expressed on exhausted T cells, but also on myeloid cells, NK cells, um, and other immune cells that can actually have potentiation effect on T cell activation, as well as targeting PDL1 on tumor cells. And the goal of this uh, molecule is obviously to sort of address what, what we're seeing in the clinic. There are TIM3. Um, combination strategies of TIM3 antibodies with PD1 antibodies or PDL1 antibodies that we have, as well as uh, multiple other companies, which have shown some hint of benefit, but whether we can really expand on that by integrating those approaches in the same molecule. Um, certainly, we can see that in vitro we can really enhance um, uh, T cell activation and in an increased way compared to um, looking at either antibody approach alone. But I think more importantly is that because you're getting dual binding of T cells and tumor cells, or immune cells and tumor cells, that you can actually, again, redirect lysis and redirect potentially tumor cells, uh, T cells into the tumor. So this is just showing you that when these cells, different cells expressing either PDL1 or TIM3 are labeled differentially, you can get a, a new population upon binding of the antibody that um, basically is bringing these cells together, so it has a different location in the facts analysis. You don't get any of that if you just combine a TIM3 antibody and a PDL1 antibody separately. So that bridging effect, whether it's really meaningful in the clinic, I think we have yet to see, but it certainly suggests that the potential for um, integrated approaches within the same molecule is very broad and potentially much greater than combination approaches themselves. And I, I think we and others are obviously looking at if you can actually solve um, some of this integration problem by making bispecific antibodies, can you make tri-specific antibodies? One of the things that we already know from combination approaches 
uh, with immunotherapy is that it re likely requires more than one approach to targeting T cells, that uh, many of the combinations are looking at other co-stimulators of T cells to enhance a PD-1 response, whether or not you're actually targeting T cell, whether or not you're actually targeting tumor cells, can you actually both target a tumor cell and maybe have integrated multiple approaches on the T cells themselves within the same molecule? And I think this is an approach which I hope will yield even better results and, and, and hopefully, again, more specific results than what we're seeing with bispecifics or bites. So, I mean, I would just like to uh, sort of summarize by, by saying, you know, I think there, we are really in a very different era of cancer therapeutics than we were even five years ago, but certainly 10 years ago. Um, the foundation, actually, of oncology has shifted from being chemotherapy, which was the foundation for many, many years and a very unsuccessful and toxic foundation at that, um, to, to immunotherapy, to PD-1-based therapies. These are the standard of care in many different malignancies now, moving in earlier lines of therapy where we see even better results. Neoadjuvant neo, um, approaches prior to surgery have shown actually probably the most robust results of all when patients have the most intact immune uh, uh, response capabilities. So I think we'll see a dramatic further shifting of our standards of care to really being um, immunotherapy focused from the very beginning. That doesn't necessarily mean that the other modalities go away, but hopefully we can use them in an integrated way and a smart way to actually enhance the ability of immunotherapy to result in long-term survival. So being able to select the right patients for the right combination or the right therapy in general is really critical. It is still a challenge, but we have the tools to do that, even with crude biomarkers, and the more we integrate those, I think we'll get better and better at the selection. But we also, because we have a much better ability to deal with big data, than we did five years ago or 10 years ago, have an ability to integrate larger and larger sets of biomarkers in a clinically relevant way. The next generation of immunotherapies, I think, are just starting in the clinic, but I think given what we've seen happen and the transformative change we've seen happen in the last 10 years, I think we're gonna see continued very rapid transformation in all types of cancer care um, with these integrated approaches of combination IOIO therapies and maybe ult ultimately, ideally, these novel multifunctional molecules. The biomarker strategy is really the core component that we have to not forget about all these approaches, though. Um, none of these things are without toxicity, and while there's been a lot of discussion about PD-1 therapeutics, anti-PD-1 therapeutics as being less toxic than chemotherapies, they have different toxicities, and they can still cause patients to die just from the therapy themselves. And the, the more aggressive we get about enhancing T cell responses, the more um, risk that we bring into that equation. So I think really trying to select patients who are gonna get benefit and being more and more specific about the approaches is the path forward, but it's a very exciting time to be in cancer care. So I will stop there and can take questions. audience. So philosophically, are you looking, um, when you bring these IO things together, are you looking for something uh, that is kind of a two-in-one, or are you looking for new biology? And how do you test for new biology early on? What assays will actually give you any kind of uh, meaningful translatable readout? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. How do you test for new biology? I think uh, one of the real challenges for immunotherapy is that it's very hard to model um, therapeutics in traditional models for cancer, in traditional mouse models. Um, the mouse immune system is just not the same, and we're, we have um, some approaches to make that more humanized, but I think they're very, very imperfect. And in fact, I think a lot of what's happened so far in immunotherapy has been experiments in the clinic, in patients, in humans, which means it takes a long time to really understand the biology. And I think um, we have to get better at trying to do that um, with more human-type models. One of the things I guess I, I, I um, am very interested in seeing built out more, and one of the approaches that we take at Lilly is really trying to look more at these um, short-term ex vivo human models using fresh tumors with intact immune cells within the tumor to try to actually look at what is your drug doing in that setting, what is the combination drug doing, and how do you separate out the effect. So I think that will be really important, is actually getting better models and more human models to really look at these effects. And, the more, and because there are so many patients going on clinical trials, because there are so many clinical trials, there actually is a lot of opportunity to do that. But it has to be done in a very integrated and focused way, because these are precious samples, these are people, 
um, and, and you have to do as much as you can with as little as amount uh, as possible. So it's a, it's a different approach, I think, that we'll have to take in the future. I do think that that complementary mechanism of action is an important one that, you know, what we've seen so far from looking at um, combinations of T cell agonists with checkpoint inhibitors has been, I think, really modest, or if anything, at best, so that, uh, you know, two similar types of approaches of targeting the T cell may not be the best way to enhance, enhance immune response enhance immune response where you're really having two targets on the same cell versus actually targeting T cell priming outside of the lymph node or getting a more robust neoantigen expression and neoantigen responses um, combined with the checkpoint inhibition, combining myeloid immunosuppression approaches with uh, enhancing um, proliferation or in T cell infiltration would, would I think have potentially better uh, results, but I guess we'll see. I don't think we know that yet. Uh, can you comment on why immune agonists have not done well? I mean, we, even in, in my company, uh, AstraZeneca, MediImmune, we tried many, many immune agonist molecule. And yeah. they, their performance, including CD40, OX40, GITA, CD137, they haven't really, you know, there was a lot of hype about those molecules, but they haven't done well. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I agree. I don't know that I know the answer fully, but I would guess that there's multiple explanations, actually. One of which being that they're agonist molecules. We may not have really actually gotten the right dose in the right combination, right? Because it, this is the problem, this is also the issue when you make biospecifics, is that you have to get the right affinity for each portion to have the most robust effect. Um, and I don't know that that was achieved by these combination strategies that have been done so far. I also think that there hasn't been yet uh, a lot of attempts on the part of industry, which I, I think we all need to change, to actually try to isolate effects. I, I think one thing we know is that if you, um, if you postulate something to be doing something, even if you don't get tumor efficacy from a single molecule approach, I think you have to be able to show that you're getting the immunologic so endpoint right. that then when you combine it could actually lead mm -hmm. to efficacy. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that has been done really with any of the approaches that have been taken to date. They've mostly been combinations that are put together. You can't separate out the effect. I mean, and it's hard to know mm -hmm. whether they're doing anything at all. I think what we, we saw that in our trials that you do see some, you know, some response. But the question is, is it, clinically, is it clinically meaningful yeah. for the combination? You yeah. do see, see sometimes, you know, T cell response, you see some other gene signature, interferon gamma, all that. But, but the question always is that, is, is 2.2 fold, one and a half fold, or three fold, is that clinically meaningful for the combination? Right, right. The, and and, and that's, that's where the major problem. And also, we are spoiled by the immune checkpoint inhibitors like PD ones and PDL one. We all expecting we'll see the similar kind of responses with yes, agonist molecules. Right, and okay. and uh, obviously since 2012, we're still at that threshold. But uh, but I, I think that you're right. We have to be looking. The PDL one agents have set the bar higher. We have to look for a big threshold effect. Are there any questions in the overflow room? All right, anyone else have a question? Huh? Okay. There are no questions in the overflow room. Oh. Uh, one, question I ha one question I have separate from you know, what the therapeutic might look like. Can you also comment on the timing of when you want to give the therapeutic in the clinical setting? I mean, can you comment at all about what you're seeing in terms of the trend of wanting to, especially with immunotherapy, wanting to treat in a more pre-surgical adjuvant setting, and if that would impact how we would want to design our molecules based on either beginning before or after? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and certainly what we have seen to date, although the, st the studies uh, that have been uh, presented or published are still pretty small, is that we're seeing the most robust uh, responses early on, when patients are early stage and they have potentially the most intact immune system. They haven't evolved maybe more and more opportunities for immunosuppression. Um, the problem with that, though, in terms of designing therapeutics is that, um, you know, in some ways it goes back to the ultimate problem in cancer, which is that if we could detect cancers earlier and remove them, we just have better ca cancer control overall. The fact of the matter is that in lung cancer, even if you can detect a tumor early, the chances of recurrence are extremely high. And the majority of lung cancers are, are, are diagnosed when they're metastatic, not again because people 
aren't necessarily looking, although there's part of that, but part of it is because the metastasis often happens when tumors are microscopic. So until we get to a place where we can really catch them before they've disseminated, and microscopic metastases happen even in resectable cancers, um, catching, you know, designing things for earlier stages is, is only meaningful in, to the extent that you can actually get patients at earlier stages. So for breast cancer, for prostate cancer, although you get micrometastatic dissemination, you still are getting, you're still de um, detecting cancer when patients are often surgically addressable, whether or not they're curable, but they're surgically resectable. And those are opportunities for designing therapeutics. For a lung cancer, I really think it is harder because I, you know, we are always going to grapple with the problem that metastases happen when the tumor is microscopic, and we can't find any of the cancer until it's widely metastatic, and uh, the immune system is more compromised. So I, I, I don't know if, we, in terms of designing therapeutics, you can really think about the problem in that way. Although obviously, I, I do think and I do agree that we should be trying to use as much of these modalities as early on as we possibly can. Hi, we have a question in the overflow room. Hi, um, my question is back with the biomarkers. Uh, they're obviously incredibly important. Is there an effort with across the community to systemize how we're looking at biomarkers so that depend, no matter who's doing the study, we could learn from it and understand are the biomarkers working and we could do a better comparison across studies? You know, that is a really good question. I think uh, the answer is both yes and no. I think when companies are developing drugs, they're not necessarily all using the same approaches. And the problem is we don't really know what the best approach is for any of these things. Uh, you know, even though uh, Merck used PDL1 um, proportion score on tumor cells, um, and, and people actually sort of almost disparaged Genentech uh, for, for using an antibody that was maybe not as sensitive for, the, for looking at tumor cells because they were trying to capture immune cell expression. Now Merck's current studies are actually more commonly using a combined positive score of immune cell and tumor cell um, uh, expression because in, in many tumor settings, actually that really is more important. And in many tumor settings, it's, more, it's easier to get the immune infiltrate than from small lung cancer biopsies, for example. So different settings, different ability to get tissue and different ability to test different things have, have dictated what types of approaches are used. That being said, there are um, more broader efforts to, to comprehensively immunoprofile tumors that are going on. There's an NCI initiative, actually, that involves multiple companies and multiple institutions to um, comprehensively profile uh, patients with uh, uh, before and after immunotherapy with uh, flow cytometry, with RNA, comprehensive RNA expression, with single cell RNA-seq in some settings, with multiplex immunofluorescence or multiplex IFC, um, with uh, stool analysis for microbiome and, and other approaches in an integrated fashion to get a really common set of data that can be used by everybody. And there's actually a, a big initiative in Europe doing the same thing. So there are attempts to do that. I think it will take time. Um, just because we all don't know what the best approach is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.